and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And I will do my best to try and make this an engaging presentation. And I also um, would really, uh, I, although I do generally appreciate questions at the, uh, throughout the presentation, I have allotted plenty of time at the end. Uh, so if there's any questions that you have, um, please write them down and there will be opportunity to, to ask at that point. So let me begin by just uh, giving a little bit of uh, introduction to my office. So the Office for Civil Rights is part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and we enforce regulations prohibiting discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, disability, age, and sex by recipients of federal financial assistance from my department, the Department of Health and Human Services. So throughout this presentation, I'm going to be referring to covered entities. Covered entities are recipients of federal financial assistance from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. My office is responsible for ensuring compliance as well with the HIPAA Privacy, Security, and Breach Notification Rule, which I'm sure you are all familiar with, but I'm not going to talk about today. What I am going to talk about today are the civil rights laws, or the major civil rights laws that we enforce. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Age Discrimination Act, and Section 1557 of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. This new provision, Section 1557, you may not be familiar with. Um, the, our department is currently in the midst of writing regulations for it, but it was uh, enforceable upon um, being signed by the President and it includes sex as a prohibited uh, basis for discrimination. So for primarily for the investigators and compliance officers in the room, I wanna talk a little bit now about different types of discrimination. Um, it's not just a, there's one thing. There's actually three different types or three theories of discrimination. Um, and you know, the Office for Civil Rights fulfills its mission in, in enforcement primarily by investigating complaints. The first type and the one that we are probably most familiar with is what we refer to it as disparate treatment. And when an individual claims that they've been discriminated against, usually this is what they are saying. They, and they have to articulate to us for us to accept a complaint for investigation, they have to articulate a prima facie case of discrimination. And prima facie means, is Latin for on first appearance. So the first part of a prima facie case is that the individual has to be the member of a protected class. So uh, that means that they are a person with a disability um, or that they are alleging that because of their particular race or because of their particular age, or because they were female or male, um, that they were somehow, that that is the reason why they were discriminated against. They have to say that they were eligible to receive services and that despite their eligibility, they were rejected or denied. So to put that in more simpler terms, um, I am a person with a disability. I was denied treatment by uh, this particular provider and I, sh I believe that I was eligible to receive services, that there was no other reason other than because of my disability that I was denied services. The second kind of type of discrimination is called disparate impact. Um, this usually uh, involves a covered entity having a facially neutral policy or practice that the individual, the complainant alleges, has a disparate impact on a protected class. So, for example, um, an ambulance company will only serve or will only um, respond to um, uh, complaint or respond to emergencies in a particular area and says that they will not go to another area because it's too dangerous for their um, their staff to go to that area. Well, someone could argue, well, that, that area that you say is dangerous actually has a larger proportion of people who are 
um, African American or Latino or some other ra a, a racial group basically alleging disparate impact because of race and because the individual, because that policy disparately impacts people of color, then in fact that is a violation of Title VI. And that, so that would be the allegation, that would be the prima facie case. Um, these are hard, much harder to prove, uh, usually require statistical evidence, and we don't get these all that often. Sometimes we do get cases where um, a, they'll allege that a hospital closure actually has a disparate impact typically on um, a community of color and you know obviously the hospital will say well it was a, it was a neutral policy we, this hospital simply was not economically feasible and that was the reason why the case the hospital is closing um, so that would be but so that's the, the the policy we're closing it because of economic reasons retaliation very similar to a disparate treatment allegation the three facets are that the individual engaged in protected activity. So protected activity would be exercising your rights under any of the civil rights regulations. For example, asking for an interpreter would be a protected activity or filing a complaint alleging discrimination based on disability is protected activity. Um, so the individual engaged in protected activity the covered entity knew of the protected act activity, um, and then the covered entity took adverse action against the individual. Um, typically, that looks like being terminated if you're an employee, or being dismissed from a medical practice if you're a patient. Um, it can be lesser forms of adverse activity, but those are the most common. And then the complainant needs to argue, needs to make a causal connection between the protected activity, again, filing the complaint or engaging, um, exercising their rights. Um, they have to make a causal connection between the protected activity and the adverse action. Um, typically, that will be simply the amount of time that is, separates those two events. There's no hard and fast rule here, but typically anything like six months between the protected activity and the adverse action, you can say there's a causal connection. Once you start getting beyond six months, it's much harder to say there's a causal connection. But in either case, you would still need to try and interview the individual to try and determine what makes them think there is a connection between the adverse action and the protective activity. So, to try and sum that up a little bit more, so an individual files a complaint, they have to identify their, the protected basis, race, sex, disability, age. They have to identify some kind of adverse action some, or a denial of service or some inaction or action of the covered entity that they believe is because of their protected basis, their protected class. And that's basically, to, to file a complaint with us, that's basically all they have to be able to do is articulate those things. We will ask them well, so you were denied services or the covered entity didn't do something for you that you believe is discriminatory. What makes you think that that action or inaction was because of your protected class, your, uh, because of a protected basis? Frequently, there's not anything very hard and concrete, not often that people are going to say anything um, that would be considered overtly racist or prejudicial, but they, they're, sometimes it does happen. Um, but sometimes they just say, well, I, you know, I just know it because there was no other reason. Okay, that, that's, that is enough for us at least to accept the complaint. So then we would go back to the covered entity and say, we got this complaint, they were alleging, they, the complainant, was alleging that they were, you know, denied this service um, or were, you know, denied admission, denied treatment because of protected aid basis, provide us with a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for your action. 
why do you think it, it happened? Why did you do that particular action? And we give them the opportunity to explain that to us. And then ideally we ask that they provide us with policies and procedures that support their position. So again, something like they were denied admission to a nursing home, well, what are your admissions policies? If you say you deny this person admission because of you know, reason X, well then it, that should be a policy. You should be able to point to that and, and justify that. Um, we will also ask for typically other unrelated policies and procedures, but ones that show that they, are in, that they, the covered entity, are in compliance. So things like a general non-discrimination policy, um, a grievance procedure, um, a notice of language um, assistance, for example, are all policies and procedures or other things that we might look for. Um, the other, or the next step in the investigation would be, well, particularly if there are not real clear policies that substantiate the non-discriminatory reason that the covered entity took whatever actions it did, you know, terminate the patient from the practice, then we would say, well, show us that you treated similarly situated persons the same way. So this is a, a, a difficult concept sometimes, or not difficult concept, but difficult to actually find this category of people. So if um, a patient was terminated from a practice and the covered entity said, well, the reason that they were terminated from the practice was not because they were disabled. The reason they were terminated was because they were uh, late for appointments. Okay, so first of all, this, there should be a policy about terminating patients. There should be a policy about um, being late for appointments. And then we should be able to show, our, so give me the names of other individuals that you have terminated from your practice um, because they were late and presumably were not disabled. If the covered entity cannot provide any other examples, it becomes very hard to show then, yeah, why why this one individual who is filing the complaint? Why is this the one person who was late that you terminated from your practice? Really, have you never had anyone else who was late or you just particularly singled this one individual out? Those are the circumstances where it becomes much harder to you know, demonstrate that the covered entity is in fact in compliance. So I think the message that I would like to make at this point is is that it's all that it's a good idea to have policies and procedures even if you are representing a small clinic um, those kinds of actions like terminating patients um, there should be clear policies and procedures for that and if you are going to um, you know start start terminating an individual uh, for things like tardiness, failure to pay bills, those should all be official policies and procedures. They don't have to be extensive by any stretch of the imagination, but you need to have some kind of you know, supporting evidence if anyone is going to file a complaint in the future that perhaps they would argue, well, no, you singled me out. It was really because I've got a disability or it's because I, um, I'm, I'm female. So now I'm going to talk about the actual regulations and the requirements for the particular regulations. So the first one and, and sort of the, the grandfather of the civil rights regulations uh, is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination on the base of race, color, and national origin. So prohibitions. Uh, covered entities may not subject an individual to segregation or separate treatment, treat an individual differently in determining eligibility for services, restrict an individual in the enjoyment of any benefits or privileges, or utilize any criteria or methods of administration which have the effect of subjecting individuals to discrimination. So Title VI 
despite the fact that there's been significant progress in racial equality over the last several decades, it still matters. And there's two main reasons why Title VI, Title VI still matters in healthcare today. And the first of which actually draws on these last two provisions, um, the restricting the individual in the enjoyment of benefits, privileges, or utilizing criteria or methods of administration which have the effect of subjecting individuals to discrimination. And that has to do with its impact on persons who are limited English proficient. So in this Supreme Court case, Lau v. Nichols, the Supreme Court found that Title VI prohibited conduct that has a disproportionate effect on limited English proficient individuals because such conduct constitutes national origin discrimination. So this particular case was actually an education case. It had to do with a school district in San Francisco which had a significant population of Chinese speaking students. And as a result of this, there were some executive orders um, that, that applied among other to the health, US Department of Health and Human Services and the executive order was that HHS, you need to do something to ensure that your recipients, that covered entities under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services do not, discriminate, do not discriminate against individuals who are limited English proficient. So in response to that, HHS developed this LEP guidance. And it describes how a covered entity may determine the extent of its obligation to provide language assistance to LEP individuals using a four-factor analysis. It responds to concerns of smaller providers by emphasizing the flexibility in meeting the needs of LEP individuals. So what is the four-factor analysis? So basically what it says is every covered entity, every recipient of federal financial assistance from HHS should Determine what the number or proportion of LEP individuals that are eligible to be served or likely to be affected by the program or service. So that basically, in other words, that's talking about your service area. So if your service area is Portland, the city of Portland, then according to the U.S. Census Bureau, according to school district data, what percentage of the population in Portland speaks a language, does not speak English well, um, and what language group do they primarily speak? And so, you know, in most of the United States, usually the number one language is Spanish, um, followed by, I believe it's Chinese and Vietnamese are the most common languages. So this is, again, this is service area. This isn't necessarily whom you as a clinician are actually seeing walk through your door. It's your service area, who potentially could walk through your door. Then the next factor is the frequency of contact with LEP individuals. Those are the people that are actually walking through your door. So the, the, the main idea here is, is if your service area has a 20% you know, population of LEP Hispanic, and yet you only see maybe, I don't know, one or two Latino patients per month, that suggests that there's something not quite right here, that your service area is much broader than that, and maybe there's a reason why you have so few Hispanic individuals that are walking through your door. And that suggests that you may need to do more to provide language assistance. So three and four of the third and fourth factor, nature and importance of the program activity or service, has to do with the idea that if you are a solo provider, a dentist, you're not to belittle the importance of dentistry and good oral hygiene, but that does not have the same level of critical importance that a um, trauma hospital or a critical access hospital or even a primary care provider might have. So there's not the same level of obligation to provide services there. And the last factor, cost and resources, that again, a hospital or a multi-specialty clinic is going to have more financial resources, more staff overall, to be able to provide more language assistance. 
So sort of the, the first two are balancing the need and the third and fourth are sort of balancing the, the ability. As a result of doing the four-factor analysis, the covered entity may decide that they actually need to do a language access plan to better figure out the, the kinds of language assistance they need to provide. So the first part of that would be tracking and recording language preference. So when you have someone who comes in through your door, do you actually ask them if they speak a language other than English, and if so, what is it? Um, do you have any mechanism to inform LEP individuals about the services that are available, that you have interpreters or you have a language line? Um, do you have a mechanism to actually take, you know, so it's not enough just to actually track the language needs of your patient population. You actually need to do something with it. You need to actually start compiling that data. Uh, do you have a mechanism to respond to calls and correspondence? So meaning if someone calls your office and they are speaking Cambodian, do you have a mechanism to be able to communicate with them? Or if they write to you in Russian, do you have a mechanism to be able to communicate with them? Do you have a, a way of being able to request translations of documents? And do you have a process to be able to respond to any complaints that you haven't provided language assistance? <coughs> There are many ways to fulfill a need for language assistance. Obviously, the most common form, bilingual staff. And um, we encourage, because of the fact that they already are members of your workforce, we encourage people to use um, bilingual staff members to provide language assistance to their LEP clients. Uh, another option, although I understand many small providers are resistant because of the cost, are to use contracted um, interpreters, you know, in-person interpreters, and almost all major um, uh, metropolitan areas have uh, those services available. They can be expensive. Um, more cost-effective, uh, telephone language line. Um, maybe not ideal in some circumstances. Uh, frequently, you know, hospitals and um, It's preferable in many cases for hospitals to have um, not only bilingual staff but also to have in-person interpreters because of the fact that there may be very complex medical procedures that need to be discussed, um, complicated um, um, side effects to treatments, things like that, which may not be as easily conveyed using a telephone interpreter. But certainly for most relatively routine kinds of communications with a provider, uh, a telephone language line may be very, may be very appropriate. Uh, coming in popularity is video relay service. I'm going to talk that, about that a little bit more. Uh, it's also used frequently with individuals who are deaf and communicate in American Sign Language. But a video relay is becoming more common as well with um, provision of language assistance. Uh, another option that can be used in some circumstances are community volunteers. If there is a you know, Russian cultural center um, that's nearby and you don't have, you, know, you have one or two Russian speaking individuals that come into your clinic um, it, and it, it may be appropriate in that case to sort of um, contact the Russian cultural center to ask them if they have anyone who might be willing to interpret um, someone who may have familiarity with uh, you know, be truly bilingual and also have familiarity with um, the medical terminology, which of course is the, the other issue. And we do get complaints from time to time about the competence of interpreters, and that really is uh, the important thing when using, when considering any of these types of um, interpreters is really that they have to be, they have to be competent. So it's more than being bilingual, they have to know the appropriate terminology uh, can they maintain confidentiality and privacy? These are clearly, you know, the advantages um, using, um, you know, bilingual staff from your own clinic because um, they've already had training on HIPAA, for example. Um, are they a neutral party, or could there be a conflict of interest? So, you know, you know, again, using a community volunteer may be problematic for that last um, bullet point. 
we emphasize the fact that covered entities should respect the LEP individual's desire to use an interpreter at their own choosing instead of free language assistance expressly offered by the covered entity. So sometimes it is true that an individual may prefer to have a family member uh, as their interpreter, um, but we really encourage the covered entity to consider whether that's appropriate given the fact that um, some issues just may not be uh, appropriate to discuss with a family member, such as domestic violence, mental illness, sexually transmitted diseases, um, where there, clearly there could be some issues that you don't want to share with the family member. And um, you know, a, a child just may not have the appropriate maturity to be able to handle that as well. As I mentioned, in addition to being able to provide language assistance for oral communication, there also is a, is a concern about ensuring that you're providing written interpretation or written translation as well. Um, again, in a small provider's office, there may not be that many vital documents, but a hospital certainly will have many more and that's why you know, it's very important to make sure that you have a mechanism to be able to translate documents. And it may not be the same person. You may have a, a medical assistant who's um, bilingual in Spanish, and they may do a wonderful job of interpreting, but maybe their written skills are not really that great, and they may not be appropriate to actually translate your documents. So you shouldn't assume that because one, one source for oral interpretation works well, that that automatically is going to be the solution to your written translations as well. Um, some examples of vital documents, applications to participate, complaint intake forms, notice of rights, award or denial notices, um, content on websites. Uh, this is one thing that frequently gets missed even among relatively large hospital systems that shall, of course, remain nameless. Um, yes, if you have you know, documents, vital documents that you have translated and you have them on your website, um, you need, I mean, if you, have them, if you have them translated at the actual hospital and you have the English version on your website, you also need to have the translated version on your website as well. So for example, your notice of privacy practices, which all covered entities know they need to have on their website, also need to have that in any other languages that they have available that they've already translated. Um, there is a safe harbor provision to translated documents that basically meaning that it will be presumed that you have met the obligation to provide language assistance uh, for written documents in that um, you provide written translation of vital documents for each eligible LEP language group that constitutes 5% or 1,000 individuals, whatever is, whichever is less. So basically, again, if you've got you know, Portland, 10% of Portland is LEP Hispanic and 5% is LEP Chinese, those you would have, um, all of your vital documents you would have translated into Spanish and Chinese, but let's say only 3% of the population of Portland is LEP Vietnamese, you would not necessarily have to provide translated documents in Vietnamese, you would be, you would there, would, however, have to tell an individual who was LEP Vietnamese that you are able to provide competent oral interpretation of those documents. So essentially, you would have someone read the document to them in Vietnamese. So to sum up, so Title VI, why do we still care about Title VI? First of all, because it is what underpins the obligation to provide language assistance to limited English proficient individuals. And it is why that if you do not provide language assistance to limited English proficient individuals, you may face um, a complaint of discrimination, which very, very well may lead to um, an investigation by my office um, and some additional technical assistance to help uh, see the importance of providing language assistance. Um, again, small providers have um, resisted this, uh, and I think 
we have been able to make some inroads by talking about the advantages uh, just to simply be able to communicate to avoid malpractice, to improve the doctor-patient relationship. All of those things are improved with the availability of competent language assistance. And um, again, there are many cost-effective ways to be able to provide language assistance. And so, um, you know, at least in the Pacific Northwest, we have not received a lot of feedback or a lot of negative um, feedback about um, our work to ensure language assistance. Second reason Title VI still matters, health disparities. So health disparities are defined as differences in rates of disease, health care access, treatment, or outcomes associated with race or ethnicity that adversely affect the health status of racial and ethnic minorities and that may violate Title VI. There's a wealth of evidence to demonstrate the existence of health disparities. White patients receive more health care services and achieve better health care outcomes than African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, and Asian Americans. Uh, for example, the rates of diabetes in blacks and American Indians is much higher than whites, 11.4% um, for blacks, 14.9% for American Indians, and only 8.4% for whites. Uh, differences in health outcomes. Uh, there are different dif disproportionate differences in health outcomes. Mm -hmm. The rate of death from stroke is almost 80% higher for blacks than it is for whites. Differences in access to health care. Minority children have poor, he poor health and oral health and less access to preventative dental care. And fewer black and, his sen and Hispanic senior citizens receive flu shots than do whites, actually. 50% uh, of blacks and 49% of Hispanics compared to 68% of whites receive a flu shot. We are having technical difficulties. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so why do why do health disparities exist? Well, there are multiple reasons. Um, some of which are actual clinical differences. There is a growing body of research that uh, that suggests that. Um, Gen that r racially, uh, there are racial differences in genetics that can affect how different racial and ethnic groups metabolize different medications and then that can result in different healthcare outcomes. And perhaps more well known, uh, there are lack of, there's differences in access to healthcare. Um, many racial and ethnic groups do not have the same access to healthcare, have access to health insurance and there are institutional barriers to healthcare um, that include the inability to pay, um, although with the Affordable Care Act, that is getting less. Um, and then there is the patient-physician interaction, differences in uh, communication styles between patients and physicians that have to do with educational differences, but also cultural background uh, can also impact how um, the physicians and patients um, communicate. And then obviously, as I have discussed, um, language barriers c can obviously have a significant impact on the ability to um, achieve good health care. And then there are actual racial and ethnic bias uh, that can lead to uh, differences in treatment and outcomes. <clears throat> okay, I just broke it. So, um, I don't want to suggest that, um, that, that healthcare, you know, that, that, that racial bias necessarily has to be 
someone who is, you know, a closet member of the Ku Klux Klan or anything like that. But there are ingrained biases that we all grew up with that actually can manifest themselves. Um, there was a very, very provocative study that was done. It's kind of old now, but it was published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 1999, and it involved 720 physicians. Um, and they, the experiment was that they were given short videotaped um, interviews with patients. And the patients had exactly the same script, but they varied in terms of whether or not they were male or female, or white or African American. They were all the same age, they were all dressed exactly the same, they were all wearing patient gowns, um, and again, the script was the same, but again, the only variance was whether or not they were male or female, white or black. And then these 720 physicians were randomly assigned um, uh, two of these, uh, or actually I think it was just one of these uh, videos to watch, and then they had to answer a series of questions. And the idea being whether they would actually ultimately refer these individuals for um, a, uh, a cardiac catheterization or not. And then they, and they also had to answer a bunch of questions about what they thought about the patient. Um, and as you may or may not be surprised to find out, there were actually statistically significant differences in the results of cardiac catheterization referral based on the race and gender of the patients. Um, they were, cardiac catheterization rates were, referral rates were much lower for the black patients and the women. And when, you know, when they sort of analyzed the sort of personality assessments that the physicians gave to these individuals, um, they, the results were that um, physicians rated the um, the white women were perceived to be sadder and more worried than their male counterpart, counterparts. Black women were thought to be more likely to over-report symptoms, which may account for their lower, lower referral rates. White men were thought to be more likely to sue, and so they actually had the highest rates of referral. And white women perceived as like being more likely to comply with treatment. So the, the upshot of this is that, you know, we, we that, that racial bias still exists, and it doesn't have to be this kind of virulent, like, I don't like somebody of that particular race. It, it still has to do with just these, these different perceptions, and when those different perceptions can manifest in different treatment recommendations, that can be prohibited conduct under Title VI. So I just leave you all with that particular slide just so that you're aware that, again, Title VI matters, and it's important to be aware of these. So moving on to, and I still broke it. Um, moving on to disability. So the, um, the primary regulation here is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, it prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability. And the next slide is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which uh, is essentially a, a mirror to Section 504. Um, but it applies to state and government agencies and was amended in 2008. Next slide. So the, um, I, I am going to talk a little bit about some of the basic definitions because the amendments to the Americans with Disabilities Act does actually um, make some fairly significant changes to how we think about uh, disability and how we investigate disability complaints. Um, I do remember that when I first started as an investigator that we really did have to kind of um, probe fairly deeply um, when an individual said that they were disabled, it, you know, unless they were, you know, clearly said, I am blind, I am deaf, I am in a wheelchair. If, if it wasn't one of those very clear cut, no question about it, there was a lot of questioning we'd have to go through. Um, 2008 amendments um, changed that. Um, and the reason why is because, so disability is defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Next slide. I'm going to give Mavella a real workout here. Um, so the major life activities are, there's two categories now. The first category is what we are familiar with. So general list, major life activities, caring for yourself, performing manual checks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking, standing, lifting, bending. Um, 
fairly common. I think the, the second list, that major life activities also includes major bodily functions, uh, functions of the immune system, normal cell growth, digestive, bowel, bladder, neurological brain, respiratory, circulatory, endocrine, and reproductive function, functions. What does this not cover? Um, I'm only being a little bit facetious. This is a very broad definition of disability. Um, any, pretty much any condition that you can be diagnosed with, even if it has no overt manifestation, high blood pressure. That meets this definition. So if someone says, so I, I mean, I, will, I, won't I won't belabor this point, but I will just say to that when someone says they are disabled, we no longer question that very much. What is your disability? Pretty much, you know, I have high blood pressure. Okay, that's, that's fine. That's all we need to know. Um, next slide. So obviously, um, individual with a disability and the regulations protect individuals with disabilities. How does that apply? Well, you have a substantially limiting impairment. Again, I have, I, I am deaf, I am blind, obvious. I have a history of having a substantially limiting impairment. Um, I tested positive for tuberculosis 20 years ago. Okay, so, if it, so I could make an argument that the reason I was denied admission to that nursing home was because I tested positive for tuberculosis 20 years ago, even though I've never actually had any symptom of tuberculosis. Uh, or the individual is regarded as having a substantially limiting impairment, and this also got expanded under 2008. Um, it doesn't matter whether or not um, the, the person, so I, I, the easiest way to explain this is to say, if someone argues that they are disabled because they are regarded as having a disability, what is, what is the disability? Um, they could say it's high blood pressure. It doesn't mean that the person who is subjected to discrimination has to actually say that they, that, that, that they have any impact from the high blood pressure. It's just enough for, to say that someone regards me as having that particular condition. And the other point I want to make with this is that it doesn't matter whether or not the person has any medication or um, the condition is treated or not, that is really irrelevant for being considered um, disabled or not. Um, next slide. Um, so a covered entity may not exclude an individual with a disability, deny an individual um, with a disability the benefits of a program, afford an, an individual with a disability an opportunity to participate in a benefit um, that is not equal to that of others. However, a covered entity must have a responsible employee to coordinate their efforts to comply with Section 504 and adopt a grievance procedure for handling disability complaints. Um, unless you are a very small entity, this, these two provisions only apply if you have 15 or more recipients, or 15, I'm sorry, 15 or more uh, employees. Um, grievance procedure, I will just make a note about that, that a good grievance procedure will um, provide for um, an individual an opportunity to make the complaint in writing and to be able to get a response in writing from the covered entity, and usually within a certain kind of time frame. We do actually have a sample grievance procedure on our website, and I would encourage people to look at that. Uh, so there's no need to recreate the wheel. Uh, notice requirement, um, that you don't discriminate on the basis of disability. Um, how to contact the person who's responsible for um, responding to any complaints or grievances and how to file a grievance. And 
Also, and covered entity is required to provide auxiliary aids at no cost where necessary to ensure effective communication. modifications to policies and procedures and program accessibility and I will I will talk about each of those in turn so auxiliary aids so again this is similar to the idea of providing language assistance to someone who is limited English proficient the type of auxiliary aid will vary with the type of communication used by the individual, the type of communication, and the context in which the communication is taking place. So there may not be an obligation to provide a sign language interpreter to someone who is simply getting a flu shot. But if someone is coming in to have a, um, the results of their cardiac stress test um, explained to them, that would be a more complex conversation and one that would require having more than simple an exchange of notes. So what are the examples of auxiliary aids? There's a lot. Qualified interpreters, note takers, transition services. So it applies to persons who have hearing impairments, visual impairments, and sensory impairments. As I mentioned, video interpretation has become more common now as a means to communicate with both um, LEP individuals and also people with hearing impairments. Um, Department of Justice has issued guidance specifically about it because it has become more common. And we have actually received quite a few complaints about this particular kind of auxiliary aid. Um, so the requirements, according to DOJ, is that it needs to be high-speed connection, um, high-quality, real-time, clear, uninterrupted images, um, particularly with someone who is communicating with American Sign Language. The video has to be clear enough that you can actually see their hands. Uh, voices have to be clear and easily understood. And it has to be easy to, be, to set up and um, for users to be trained to use this. So they're actually, Department of Justice has actually um, gone to court uh, against hospitals um, because they're, they relied on video remote interpreting rather than an in-person sign language interpreter and found, and in, that, in the particular case that I'm thinking of, um, found that it was very, very problematic that you know, the, the screen didn't move or the camera didn't move so that the person lying on the bed wasn't able to actually see the video screen in order to be able to be, to understand what the interpreter was actually saying and vice versa. So that's why, again, it has to be movable to allow the person, you know, the patient to be either prone or sitting upright. Um, and obviously a big issue is particularly with, um, you know, equipment that's not used very often is um, staff members were frequently at a loss when, you know, it's like they had training on it five years ago and never had to use it. Now all of a sudden they have this person um, that they need to communicate with and they don't know how to use the equipment or even where to find the equipment. So this can be a very good solution, but it, there's implementation issues that you have to be aware of. And, and I would emphasize, you know, repeated training with staff, if nothing else, to make sure that everything is working correctly. Um, an individual uh, may not be required to bring their own interpreter. Same with language assistance. You cannot require the patient to bring an interpreter. Uh, an adult who is accompanying an individual with a disability may not be asked to interpret except in an emergency situation or where there's a, a specific request by the individual with a disability. Uh, and again, same consideration with language assistance that the person, the, the, the companion is an appropriate interpreter there isn't concerns about confidentiality or inability you know, to understand the medical terminology, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and I would also mention that this applies to companions as well. And we have uh, received complaints about this where the patient was um, not hearing impaired, but their spouse was. And the request was, well, I want my spouse to be able to understand 
what the doctor is saying about my medical treatment. And you, you cannot say, well, no, you, the patient, have to translate for your spouse. They're part of the treatment, and it, it, you are required to be able to provide an interpreter for the spouse as well, or whoever their partner or significant other is. Um, so it should go without saying no, no surcharges to provide um, auxiliary aids. And primary consideration should be given to the individual with a disability in terms of selecting the kind of auxiliary aid that they would like. Um, okay, reasonable modifications. So covered entities must make reasonable program adjustments based on individual needs to ensure that they are not discriminate, discriminating against individuals with disabilities. However, a covered entity is not required to make modifications that fundamentally alter the program or activity. So what are some examples of reasonable modifications? There are two common ones. Mobility aids. Um, Department of Justice has issued a whole, um, a, a large guidance document on mobility aids. I don't think I've actually seen a complaint about this yet, but presumably this is becoming more common. Um, obviously, covered entities have to allow individuals to use wheelchairs in their facilities, but they also have to allow uh, manually powered mobility aids as well. And um, so there is this new concept in the amendments to the Americans with Disabilities Act, this other power-driven mobility device. Covered entities must make reasonable modifications to permit individuals with mobility disabilities to use these um, power-driven mobility devices. Um, it is considered a reasonable modification because generally you're not allowed to, you know, drive a golf cart through a hospital. So that's why it's considered a reasonable modification. Um, although there may, you may restrict the use of these devices based on specific factors, the type, size, weight, dimensions, and speed of the device, the volume of pedestrian traffic, and the facility's design and operational characteristics. Um, other safety requirements, and you can also restrict when there's a substantial risk of harm to the environment or cultural resources, natural resources, or other federal land management laws and regulations. Service animals, um, my favorite. So we do get a lot of complaints about service animals. Um, again, it has been clarified under the ADA amendments. Service animals can only be dogs, so no service pythons, no service turtles, no service gerbils. Um, comfort or emotional support animals are not protected. However, individuals with physical, sensory, psychiatric, or other mental disabilities can use service animals. Um, there is another provision, again, I've never seen it, would kind of like to see it. Miniature horses are also permitted, um, but are not considered service animals. But again, miniature horses. So with service animals, um, they are required to have some kind of a harness, leash, or other tether. Um, unless the individual with a disability has other physical impairments that prevent them from being able to use a harness or a leash. Um, of course, I think everybody knows they are not required to have any kind of special vest or any identification as a service animal. That is not a requirement. And only two permissible questions of an individual who, ha who brings in an animal to the facility. Is it a service, is it an animal required because of a disability? And then what work or task the animal has been trained to perform? Um, may not require written documentation or certification. Now again, as I said, so comfort animals, emotional support animals are not covered, they are not protected. However, there, the range of tasks that a service animal can be trained to perform is very, very broad. Um, it can include um, not only the obvious things of helping people with physical disabilities or, you know, a seeing eye dog, but also assisting an individual during a seizure. And I've heard, you know, we've had complaints about this where the service animal will alert them that they're going to have um, a seizure and, you know, move them 
out of public um, if they're going to have a seizure, um, retrieving items, uh, providing physical support and assistance with, ba with balance and stability, um, helping people with psychiatric and neurological disabilities by preventing or interrupting impulsive or destructive behaviors. Um, I was also um, aware that um, for veterans with PTSD, they had service animals that were specifically trained that um, when, the, uh, when the veteran would enter into a room and stop for whatever, talk to someone or whatever, the animal would actually come and stand behind the, the, the veteran. And that was sort of the protective mechanism. Um, not Again, not necessarily an emotional support animal, but truly trained that, that, that the dog would go behind and face away from the patient to protect them because, again, veterans with PTSD frequently have startle response and um, can be very, um, uh, have out outbursts if they feel that they're being, um, if they're unsafe. And so this was a way to make them more safe. But on the other hand, just a general, well, it's a German Shepherd and I just feel safer with a German Shepherd with me. That's not, that's not gonna qualify as a service animal. Um, I guess I would just say, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit more about service animals at the end because we do get a lot of complaints about it, but I'll just say it here that really the, the bottom line with service animals is, is if someone says, yes, this is a service animal because I, you know, because of a disability, then that's really pretty much where you need to leave it unless, unless the animal demonstrates behavior that would not be, um, that would be considered disruptive. Um, and you certainly, as a, as a provider, as an administrator, you know, if the dog is being disruptive in any way, and, and, you know, when you confront the patient, please, your dog is barking, your dog is running around, your dog is, you know, um, tripping people, whatever, or, or, you know, whatever, any kind of disruptive behavior, if the handler cannot immediately take control of that dog, then you have the right to ask that the individual um, take the dog elsewhere. Um, but again, if, if the dog is not disruptive, just because you, you question it, it's a teacup chihuahua, and you really question whether or not it can do anything for someone with a disability, that's irrelevant. If that's not something you need to worry about, is, is the dog disruptive? At that point, then you can uh, approach. Not responsible for care or supervision. Um, basically, they're allowed anywhere the patient would be allowed. Uh, generally, cannot be restricted. Um, possibly, if you know it's a, it's a sterile surgical suite, you can make a case the dog can be excluded there. But otherwise, no. No pet fees. No cleaning fees. Program accessibility. Um, so generally this applies to uh, individuals with physical disabilities, and, and I'm surprised at this day and age that we, we actually still get these, basically for individuals in wheelchairs that you know, claim that the this covered entity is not accessible. A lot of buildings that still don't have appropriate wheelchair ramps, um, don't have the parking spaces for um, <clears throat> with the extra width for individuals um, to get out of um, wheelchair accessible vehicles. So the concern here though is that the, the program as a whole, we look at the program as a whole, whether it's accessible. So that doesn't mean necessarily that every entrance has to be accessible or every room has to be accessible. But look at the program as a whole and basically looking at all the, the services and benefits and activities that the covered entity provides are those accessible to individuals with disabilities and and so that is more important than whether or not again there's any every specific every individual entrance has a wheelchair ramp for example so if you look at the program as a whole uh, identify locations in the geographic area um, so is this a, a facility that has or a covered entity that has multiple facilities what are what's offered at each different um, location. So if, if it's a covered entity that only offers, you know, surgery at outpatient surgery at one location, then yes, that location does have to be accessible because that's the only location where that particular service is available. 
some other questions to consider. What, what loca which locations are accessible, to what extent, how dispersed are they, what are the existing barriers. Although I would say that it's important to consider you really cannot have an individual drive across town um, to go to one clinic because the one that's closest to their house isn't accessible. That's a hard defense to make. It would really behoove you if you have that situation to do what you can to make the closer facility as accessible as possible. Um, but there is the fundamental alteration defense. Um, know that I cannot make all, the, all of my areas accessible, um, undo financial or administrative burdens, uh, but the covered entity has the burden to make that defense and is still obligated to ensure that um, to take any other action that would ensure individuals with disabilities receive benefits or services. So relocating the service. Um, so again, the surgical, um, again, a, a, a covered entity with multiple clinics, surgical services only at one location. Well, is it, is it possible to move surgical services to one of the other locations? so that those services would be available to people with disabilities. Um, obviously, providing benefits or services at their home or at an alternate site or removal of the barriers. Uh, age Discrimination Act uh, prohibits discrimination on the basis of age. This is a this is a regulation that really does have to be analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis because there are so many exceptions and exemptions to it. So first of all, it does not apply to age distinctions and other laws or statutes adopted by a legislative body. So for example, you are not eligible for Medicare unless you are 65. Isn't that age discrimination? Well, no, because it's specifically exempted from the Age Discrimination Act. Um, employment practices. I don't care whether or not you discriminate on the basis of age and employment because it's not part of this regulation. So for everything else, um, there are exceptions to the Age Discrimination Act. So again, so for we're not worrying. So if it's not something that was already um, included in another statute or law, it's not an employment practice. So then possibly can it be exempted from the Age Discrimination Act because it's normal operation or statutory objective? And there's a four-part test, we like four-part tests in HHS, to determine whether it actually meets this criteria. I'm not gonna read that over. Um, other exemptions are it's in HHS regulations, or it's a special benefit program for children and the elderly or it's a voluntary affirmative action to address conditions which resulted in limited participation on the basis of age, or it's a reasonable factor other than age. So we don't get many age discrimination complaints. The most common ones that we do get, and that's like one every few years, um, tends to be um, either it's a issue with uh, some kind of a residential facility, nursing homes or assisted living, for example, that have some kind of what we would say potentially discriminatory or arbitrary age cut off that you cannot be admitted to this nursing home unless you are 65 years of age or older. Um, that would be, we've gotten complaints like that. That would have to be subjected to the um, normal operations for part test. And most of the time they can't pass the four part test and we've gotten a corrective action as a result. Um, sometimes uh, we do get cases where there's particular distinctions in the Medicaid regulations um, that you are not eligible for a particular procedure or something if you're under or if you're over a particular age. Uh, those also have to, I mean, I would just caution you that if that's something that is coming up in your, um, your health plan that you, you know, consider that carefully about whether or not that that would be um, defensible. Um, and it has to be analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, section 1557, so as I said, this is new. <coughs> it, 
It does expand our jurisdiction somewhat in, in two ways. One, it includes sex as a protected basis. And also it expands um, our jurisdiction to include the um, federal marketplaces and plans that participate in the federal marketplace the, um, the, under the Affordable Care Act. Um, those plans like that are considered to be recipients of federal financial assistance and we have so jurisdiction over them. Now, we did not used to have jurisdiction over private health plans, but particularly um, if they participate in the marketplace or if they offer a um, Medicare Part D um, prescription drug plan or Medicare Part C, Medicare Advantage plan, those are considered to be uh, federal financial assistance as well. And so, again, that, that has expanded our jurisdiction over some private health plans. So, I also mentioned before that we are still in the process of writing the regulations so for Section 57, 1557. So I can't lay out all the thou shalt not or thou shall in the same way that I did with all the other regulations. But I will talk about a couple of cases that we have investigated to give you an example of some of the um, issues that have come up that we um, have investigated under 1557. Uh, one was a denial of treatment. Uh, involving a transgendered woman who alleged that upon changing her name from a traditionally male name to a traditionally female name, in accordance with her female gender identity, she was terminated from her doctor's practice. Uh, we had a case of sexual harassment where a transgendered man alleges that when he visits the hospital where he receives primary and specialty care, he is harassed and is intentionally referred to by his previous female name, though, he no long, though they know he no longer goes by such name. Room assignment, we had a transgender woman who alleged that after reading her medical chart that documented her sexual reassignment surgery, hospital staff assigned her to a shared room with a man. And we also had a case of a, a denial of coverage where a, a transgender woman alleged that she was denied sexual reassignment surgery by her health plan, although the surgery was deemed medically necessary by her healthcare provider and the health plan would cover the specific surgical procedures if necessary to correct congenital defects. But in this case, it was um, as a result of her gender dysphoria. So, I wanna talk now about common complaints that my office receives and then give you the opportunity to ask questions for the remainder of the time. And I have talked about m most of these issues before, but again, because they come up frequently, I want to make sure that um, everybody, if they sort of dozed off, you know, in the interim, that they're sort of back with me now. So common complaints, denial of interpreters, either ASL or language interpreters. By and large, there's going to be almost no circumstances where you can categorically deny an individual language assistance or um, any kind of um, an auxiliary aid to communicate with someone who is um, hearing impaired. But that doesn't mean that there's only one way to communicate with these individuals. As I had said in the beginning, there's lots of different kinds of language assistance, bilingual staff, um, telephone interpreters, video interpreters, uh, community volunteers, as well as um, professional uh, foreign language interpreters that can provide language assistance Similarly with someone who communicates primarily in ASL, um, for many encounters, you will need to be able to provide an, an, an American Sign Language interpreter, but you, I would really encourage you to, to talk to that individual with that interpreter about what their communication needs are and whether or not that's going to be necessary for every encounter. Um, some individuals uh, who are deaf really only can communicate in ASL, so they are not able to read lips, they are not really able to communicate in writing, so really, ASL is really the only way that they can communicate. On the other hand, there are many deaf individuals who do have some ability to communicate with lip reading, to communicate with written language, with um, written notes, and for some encounters where, again, it's just simply, I need a refill of my medication, I need a flu shot, um, something like that, 
those kinds of encounters, um, again, you have the communication with the individual. Maybe that written notes or lip reading might be okay for those particular circumstances. Um, but the, the important thing to remember is that you cannot ask that they bring someone to interpret for them, that you cannot um, charge them for the cost of providing an interpreter, um, and be very, very cautious when using a family member or friend as an interpreter, and um, children are almost always going to be a bad idea as interpreters. Uh, service animals I talked about, um, in most of, the, most of the cases, it really is an issue where the, there was a doubt about whether the, the service animal was really a service animal, and that's really not the major question you should be concerned about. You know, what you should be concerned about is the presence of this animal interfering with the conducting of the business of this healthcare facility. And if the animal is not interfering with the business of the healthcare facility, it probably is not worth um, spending too much time and energy assessing whether it really is a service animal. Although, again, as I said, you know, comfort animals are, are not covered, um, emotional support animals are not covered, and you certainly can ask what, uh, you know, what the animal has been trained to do, but don't assume that that is going to mean that there's some kind of professional certification that the, that the dog has gone through. That very rarely happens, and, and, and you know, if they are professionally trained, then that's generally you're never gonna have a problem with those animals anyway. Um, physical accessibility, again, as I said, surprisingly, and, I, and there is a new scenario that has come up, and I think it is going to become more and more common, and these are for individuals who are in wheelchairs and are also um, uh, either because of um, infirmity or because of their weight, they're unable to transfer out of their wheelchair without assistance. And I have seen more than a few cases coming in where the covered entity will basically um, deny them service because we basically saying, we cannot treat you. Because you cannot get out of your wheelchair by yourself, we cannot treat you. Um, that is a real problem. And um, there's, you know, that doesn't mean that every room needs to have a Hoyer lift in it, but it does mean that you need to be cognizant of the fact that you know, individuals in wheelchairs and you know, who have other physical infirmities, um, they are you know, individuals with disability, and if they were qualified to be able to get services from you in the first place, it's very difficult for you to be able to argue, well, I can't treat you um, because you can't get out of your wheelchair. Um, there's, there's a whole, and actually on our website, there's a range of different types of, of equipment that clinics can have um, short of Hoyer lifts um, to be able to help with um, trans, um, transferring these patients from wheelchairs to exam beds and the reverse, um, as well as obviously if you have exam, um, exam tables that can move up or down also can help. Um, and then uh, denial of services to persons with behavioral issues. So these are difficult and I understand that, uh, that they're difficult for the providers as well. So the, and this is where I was suggesting at the beginning when you are um, you know, considering terminating patients or any kind of adverse actions against patients, you really need to have a clear policy about what's acceptable behavior, what are the, what are the reasons that we are going to terminate you from our practice. Um, individuals with mental um, illness can frequently be um, very inappropriate and can be difficult to work with and can, um, you know, be very angry. Uh, and it's certainly, you know, as professionals, we don't want to be yelled at. We don't want to be called names. We don't want to be, um, you know, uh, be treated rudely. Uh, and, you know, certainly we can expect that of our, our clients, our patients. But with people with, with disabilities, you know, as a healthcare provider, the assumption is that you are aware. This is not someone who you've never seen before and know, know nothing about. This is a patient that you've had a relationship with. You are well aware that they've been diagnosed with and are, and are getting treatment for whatever, schizophrenia, bipolar, post-traumatic stress disorder, whatnot. So you can't claim you didn't know. And unlike in an employment circumstance, that patient doesn't have the obligation to say to you, I have PTSD 
I don't like being in a room around other men because I was sexually assaulted and I feel really uncomfortable and it makes me very angry and scared to be in that room. I, as a patient, I don't have to explain all of that to you. You're my healthcare provider. You know that. So what, what needs to happen is if, if you as a provider know that when I am in your waiting room and I start yelling at, your, at the other patients and start yelling at the receptionist, you have, the, you have the obligation to sort of talk to me, to communicate with me. Marisa, I understand, you're upset, let's talk about this. What, I mean, you're, you're, you're very angry, you're upsetting the, you're upsetting the other patients. I don't, want, I don't want you to be upset, I don't want them to be upset. What can we do? What can we do to solve this problem? Let's come up with a reasonable modification together. And so that communication, and you need to document that, that needs to happen before you start going down the road of, well, we don't accept, we don't accept people yelling in our waiting room as patients, and we terminate people who yell in the waiting room as patients. Well, okay, you know, if that's your policy, that's fine, but you need to have the communication with the patient first to explain to them, this is what's gonna happen, and I wanna try and come up with a solution so that we don't have to go down that road. So maybe it's, you know, finding some other location for you to sit and wait. Maybe my office is, is an okay place to wait so that you don't have to be in the waiting room with all the other men. Something like that. Or maybe, you know what, you don't have to come into the waiting room. If you would feel more comfortable waiting outside, assuming it's not you know, raining or whatever, and that's something you would prefer, okay, that, that's fine, and we'll come and get you when, when your appointment's ready. You know, again, some of you should be concerned, well, Marisa, aren't you now suggesting segregation? You know, these are things you need to work out with the patient. What would be the, the best solution for them and for you so that they're not creating a disturbance and yet you're not essentially putting yourself in the, the situation where you could very well be um, you know, treating them differently because of their disability. Uh, so, I'm going to stop there and ask if there are any questions from the audience. Yeah. 